Truck Hit. I'm Dooner. This is Global Supply Chain Week. It's about time we had a week, isn't it? Thank you so much for joining us as we celebrate the supply chain. We have an awesome show for you today. I'll get into that whole rundown for you for a second. But before that, I think it's time for a PSA from the Wyoming Highway Patrol. Take a look at this video right here, right Roll this tape. The Wyoming Highway Patrol says, move over and slow down for emergency vehicles. One of our WHP troopers nearly got hit by a commercial semi-tractor and trailer recently. The near miss occurred near Rollins, Wyoming on Interstate 80. They've been having a lot of bad weather out there. He says, please slow down and move over for emergency vehicles. The uh, logistics community has chimed in, as always. Jeff Dixon says, I cannot agree more. Truck drivers should know this without being told. STFD and throw on your emergency flashers. Delana Morris says, honestly, the toughest job out there is being a recovery tow truck driver. My daddy drove a tow truck on the weekend sometimes, more when I was young, and the stories he would come back with because people wouldn't slow down. One of the drivers died because he was hit by a vehicle while trying to load up a car. I wish more people would be more more careful and slow down. Chad Crosby says, know a driver hit by a state snowplow while changing up in a chain up area. Fortunately, he saw it coming and started to get out of the way, but he did break his wrist and got beat up. Chris Mayberry says, talk about threading the needle. No doubt. By the way, you can see they blurred that trailer out there, but being that this is logistics, I imagine many of you recognize this. So uh, bonus points to whomever can name that trailer in the comments. Another story up on FreightWaves.com. You just saw with Sonar, so I want to bring this up because it puts a little bit more context on there. It's a, it's a great article. It says, for some owner-operators, it looks like the end of the line. And a few key takeaways from there were over a third of owner-operators surveyed said if things don't improve this year, they're leaving the industry altogether. 7.69% said they would consider signing on to a large carrier. 6.6% uh, said they, they would move out. And 5.5% said that they already have. So... Not looking great out there, but hopefully things pick up as uh, we see green sprouts in the spring. This is one last one. You may be seeing the rates are down, so you salespeople out here, take note. Look at what Mark A. Samuel from I1 Organics put up here. He said, it's 3.20 p.m. on a Friday. A freight broker just walked into our office unsolicited. I rarely see that happen anymore. And admittedly, we have great freight partners, but I'm sales first, and I know it'll make his weekend if we hook him up. So I had him leave his card, and my associate, Nadar, just called him right now to tell him that he's going to get one of our pickups next week. Happy Friday, sales folks. We're all in this together. Now, what's funny is I need to chastise some of you in the comments who are like, oh, yeah, well, maybe that worked for this guy, but whenever I contact someone on LinkedIn in their DMs, they don't respond to me. Did you not read the post? You have to go to the office. You can't just do the DM. You got to go in person. That's what he's saying. Going in person is your differentiator. Hit the bricks. Walk in there. Drop off a business card. That's what he wants you to do. Not send a DM. Not send an automated email. All right? Are we clear? Good, because we've got a great show today. We're going to have Wabi, right? They're trying to solve for autonomous trucking at scale. we got Dustin Cole. He's, he's going to share how they're developing their tech, and he's just back from Rila, another big conference like Manifest that we were at. So excited to, have, to hear what he has going on. Sean Jones from Quick Loads is here. He's going to demo his automated trailer. He's going to tell us how they developed it, how it works. We're going to see it live and in action, and we're going to see it pull up a trailer. But... Now, it's time for our first guest, the lovely Kristen Toth. She's the President and Chief Operating Officer over at Furnish. Kristen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. I didn't even know it was Global Supply Chain Week. How amazing is that? I didn't either. I'm glad uh, you and I are in the same boat. So, you know, you know what's really, I was looking into your background a little bit, and I knew we had something in common when we met at Manifest. We both spend time in the Commonwealth, right? You were over at MIT. You, you, you walked around Cambridge a little bit, did you not? I did. I did. And, you know, Boston's one of my favorite cities. So, yeah, spent some time over there in the Commonwealth. Ooh, did you have a favorite watering hole over that way? Uh, I mean, what, I think they're all gone. Yeah. So sad. It is. So uh, many I of the bars that were in Kendall Square, they're all like gone or something else now. Totally. Now they're all like fancy and shiny. They were not. Yeah. Kendall Square was not fancy and shiny when I was there. Um, the field in, uh, in Central Square was one of my favorites and we loved the littlest bar downtown. So you are familiar with Boston. In Boston, we have this reverse logistics event called Alston Christmas, and that is every college season, yeah. the students who live out in that area, they put all their furniture on the side of the road, and people just uh, pick it up, and, and vandals come around and, and, and take it. But you work for a company, Furnish, that deals in furniture. Tell me a little bit about what the company is. Well, I think it's a really good segue that Austin 
uh, Alston Christmas uh, <laughs> event that you were talking about. I uh, so so what Furnish is 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 uh, really a company trying to make it effortless to create your home, but in like today's society, which is highly evolutionary, uh, really high standards. Um, and so, you know, basically the, the company started when our founder, Michael, was sort of moving around New York City, actually, a lot. And every apartment had different roommates, different layouts. Everybody had different things. And there were definitely some times where he was at least tempted to uh, leave some things on the curb a la Alston Christmas. Um, and, you know, he was like, I'm renting this place. Why can't I just rent the things that go into the place? And, but, but like make them something that I really want, right? Like not the sort of furnished apartments of yesteryear. And so what we do is we rent high quality fashion forward, um, furniture, decor, you know, all the rugs, all of the tchotchkes, if you want that, artwork, mirrors, everything. And we'll rent that all to you and make it really easy for you to create this home that you love. And we do it with um, lots of local logistics because we'll do the delivery for you. We set everything up. We put it into your, your place for you. If something's not working out for you, we'll swap it out for you for free within the first three days. And then throughout your subscription, you can always call us and say, you know what, I want to add something, subtract something, swap something out. We just charge a quick fee to do that. And um, it's really, really flexible. Something changes in your life and you need to end your subscription early, no problem. Something changes about your life and you need to add or subtract things, no problem. So really trying to make it super easy for you to have the home that you love. And and so we take on all of the burden of that. And then what we do on the back end is we take back the furniture and we have refurbishment teams on staff in our warehouses. And those teams bring this product back to like new do commercial cleaning and uh, send them out again. So it's a really kind of sustainable way to have furniture for a shorter amount of time too, because we can go and find another home for your furniture when you're done with it. This is great too, because if you like break up with someone and they move out of your apartment and they're the one who ordered the furniture, you can get rid of their memory entirely. It used to just be the belongings, but nobody would take the time and effort to get all new furniture. But now you can just swap it in and wash, burn some sage and wash those memories right out of your reality. A hundred percent. You make it sound so easy, though. How does it work like behind the scenes? How do you coordinate this orchestra of furniture? Yeah, we call it furniture Tetris every once in a while. And it, it is a little bit like that. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to select the right furniture and decor. It has to be not only the things that people are going to like, but the things that are going to have these multiple lives over and over again. So they have to be stylistically great, but also have longevity. So it's not just, you know, one and done. We, it has to be very durable, of course. Um, but it has to be refurbishable, which means, you know, things with veneers or um, other materials that don't refurbish very well, like marble, those are tougher for us. Um, I will say the one thing that we don't do a lot of is white boucle. And of course, everybody wants white boucle furniture right now, but that's- What is white? Hold on. Different. I don't know what that is. What is white boucle furniture? I'm just a dumb so it's dude. It's very textured furniture. It almost has like these tiny little thread loops as the texture of the furniture. And so it like, and everybody's got like a white chair, a white ottoman, a white sofa, they're made out of this stuff. And there's just no way to clean and refurbish that stuff to make it like new for, you know, three, four, five different customers. So we're avoiding that trend for now, which, you know, is a little sad for some of us, but we, uh, <laughs> we're, we have to do what we have to do. And then the last thing is, is uh, modularity. So we want to be able to replace just the leg or the slip cover or a cushion uh, if that's the part that that we're out instead of having to replace the whole thing. So it starts with getting the right product. And then we have warehouses that are situated close to our customers. And that gives us the opportunity to be able to go out, provide this high level of service, and then also do all of the reverse logistics. And when we think about um, the business, we've had to build out a whole bunch of new technology with new concepts, not just inventory that we own that is 
not in our warehouses, not in our control, uh, and all of the tracking around that and being able to sort of see the history of a product or a piece um, over the length of its lifetime, but also the idea of each stop. So we might be going and dropping something off. We might be going and picking some other things up. We might be going and picking up something for somebody in one place and taking it to them their new apartment in another place. And so we think of everything as stops and trips as opposed to just orders because we're going to interact with the customer multiple times for that order. So we built out a lot of technology to sort of purpose fit our logistics. And um, a lot of it is proprietary and a lot of it is just using things in a slightly more uh, innovative, different way. And, um, and yeah, and then we, we run teams in our warehouses and, uh, and delivery to, to do kind of everything soup to nuts, refurbishment, warehousing, as well as all of the deliveries and pickups and all that sort of good stuff. So I was, look, I ordered a couch and I think anybody who ordered furniture in 2021 knew the furniture getting hell that was going on. I got this sectional off West Elm and it took literally six months for it to arrive at my new house. And then when it came, the frame was broken. So the replacement took another four months. So I have like this year long couch journey. How did you survive that struggle? And what kind of delivery issues do you face? Yeah, I I mean, I went through the same thing. And I think I'm coming up on a year of just trying to get a a chair that's not broken. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I think so for us, when we looked at the pandemic and all of the ch- supply chain challenges that happened, um, there were a couple things that we were uh, well positioned uh, relative to others. So first of all, our business model, right? We can service new customers with products that we already have because of customers who are coming up on the end of their subscription and they're ready to sort of turn things back into us. So we don't have to buy new furniture for every new order that we get. We're able to sort of reuse the things that we have, which is really powerful in our business model, but also really helpful when we were in a supply chain crunch. Uh, the second thing is, is because we were a startup and really, you know, cash conservative, we had really, really good partners in our supply chain, really in our vendor side. And we did we couldn't buy a lot of furniture all at once. And so we weren't super um we weren't super like dependent upon you know full containers having to come in. We had also kind of quick just in time domestic um setups that we could sort of work with. And then because we had these really deep relationships with our suppliers they we were in constant contact so okay we can't get this but what's the closest thing or what's coming up and here's our forecast and let's talk about you know where your capacity is and how you're shifting it around and we were just having really in-depth conversations so there were certain pieces that we couldn't get consistently throughout the pandemic but, but we were we had really amazing partners um on our our vendor side of things and we were able to really you know stay in stock with the right assortment of things and and support the customers who were in a, a sort of unknown very variable kind of situation where our model even works better for them so closing um, system and, and- We did actually help a lot of people who were in your situation who were like, hey, I'm trying to get this sofa, but it's going to take me 12 months. Yeah, well, you need to rent something to sit on in the meantime when you wait for the the, the damn thing to show up. It sounds like closed loop systems are your sort of competitive advantage in here. Why is that so important to your business model, especially from a sustainability standpoint? Yeah, so a couple things. So from the sustainability standpoint, there's like 10 million tons of furniture that goes into U.S. landfills every year. And a lot of that could have another life, whether it needs a little bit of uh, refurbishment or cleaning, or it's perfectly good, but the person who's giving it up doesn't know how to get it to the next person who really wants it. So we provide all of those services that keep that product in play and in sort of in useful life uh, a whole lot longer. In fact, we're trying to average at least four years, but we think we can get that to at least seven years with the right product and and the right time. We haven't been around for seven years, so we can't tell if we're averaging seven years yet, but that's really great for our business model as well, because we can buy something 
and monetize it over the course of a number of other customers. And so when you talk to somebody who's in sort of traditional retail, which is my background too, they're like, oh my gosh, you're putting all this extra logistics, all these extra touches, all this extra cost into it. And I was like, yeah, but I can sell it multiple times. So that gives us a really great business model that helps align things so that you don't have to trade off, you know, what the customer needs to pay to support something, what is really great for the environment and and good for sustainability and keeping things out of landfills and what actually is a sustainable business. All those things actually point in the same direction for us, which is sort of magical. Interesting. You know, people get emotional about furniture. I know I sure did when I kept getting all those delays and so did my neighbors when they heard me screaming through the windows. Um, that makes customer service even more important though, right? What customer service tech are you using? And I don't think everyone understands this in furniture. We're thinking a lot about our couches. And if I'm not, my wife is thinking a lot. And this comes down to like the color, the size, the scope, making sure the sectional's on the left, not the right. There's so much that goes into it. And a lot of it is just like letting the customer know what's happening, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what we try to do. And uh, I did spend a little bit of time at Amazon. So it's fun to try to compete with them now, uh, because I feel almost like I'm competing against myself. But I think that one of the things that we did learn about from Amazon and studying Amazon uh, as a company is making really great promises and then ensuring that you're set up to deliver on those promises. So the first thing is, we didn't used to have any kind of back order in our system. And as the kind of lead times stretched out during the pandemic, we were like, hey, let's build the technology to be able to offer somebody something in like to to really get their place in line. We used to have like email me back when it's back in stock. But when those lead times stretch out, right, you could get three sofas back in stock and you've got 1200 people who are signed up that want that sofa. You send out one email blast and most people can't, you know, even see it in stock because it goes so fast. Um, and so, you know, we were like, that's not a great customer experience. How do we actually allow somebody who really wants to get that to reserve their place in line and know when we expect to have that so that we can get it back out to them? And then we made sure that we built a communication process for that, whether it was in your account, you could go get it proactively or whether it was email updates along the way. And then we, we of course, have to make sure that our customer experience team who fields questions and calls from customers who need to know more, that they have the information internally as well. And I think the other thing that's really just magical about our team is how much just communication goes on, um, mostly through Slack, to be honest with you. Um, Just when people are trying to sort of get great answers for customers or make sure that we have the right kind of policies and processes to support our customers. And it allows us to really just improve and improve and improve every single day. So, I mean, on the customer service side, we use a contact management system just like everybody else, but it's it really is supported by a lot of homegrown tools that make sure that we understand what is going on with every single person's order or payment or whatever they're interested in, and that we connect those same customer service people with the rest of the team in a super meaningful way so that anything that they need to get to or know about, they can get to. What, if anything, does the furniture industry tell us about the economy? My goodness. Well, I think we've seen a lot of the same things that have happened across different industries and, it, it, you know, whether it's supply chain or it's funding, we've seen a lot of the same things. So, um, but on the customer side, it's been really interesting because obviously we spent a lot of time at home and that's where a lot of customers were investing. And so you could see that. And, and it's really funny before March, 2020, I mean, I think we rented out a few desks. Uh, for for doing work. In March 2020, we saw that just obviously skyrocket, (laughs) which was a fun supply chain uh, disruption or or forecast that we just didn't see coming, of course. Um, And so we saw a lot of customers who were really investing in their homes. And sometimes they were sort of fully redoing what they had. And sometimes they were actually just kind of sprucing it up. So bringing in throw pillows and rugs and the other things that just made it feel more homey and cozy for, for them. Um, So I think we saw a lot of like what customers were doing in terms of the demand that we saw. And then the rental model, I think, just provided for so much flexibility when you're uncertain. You don't know, am I going to stay living here? Am I going to move 
to another place? Am I going to have the job that I have? Uh, we saw rental really become a, a much better option for people who are who in, the, in who were in that uncertain situation in their lives. And so we saw a lot about the world through our customer behavior and customer demand. And as we've been coming out of that sort of lockdown there is still this sort of value on home. And so it's been, we, we had the opportunity to educate people about rental not being a terrible option, not being bad math, um, and, and really being something that is freeing and, uh, and actually a, a good financial decision. And so we're seeing a lot of halo effect from that. On the business side, of course, we saw all kinds of strange things that we couldn't have forecasted on the demand side that sort of went through our supply chain. Uh, we've seen all of the same kind of, uh, you know, costs going up and down. And we've really tried to make sure that we can insulate our customers from a lot of that variability. We have done some amount of price adjusting, but the goal has really been to keep things consistent and look at ways that we can bring our costs down so we can maintain pricing to our customers. Um, you know, we saw our vendors really go through incredible changes in not just the cost of materials, but obviously the cost of ocean freight and other transportation options. And so, you know, those got passed along to us. We're seeing those ease a little bit now. And now I think, you know, there is more entertaining. There is more sort of having people over and everyone's really embracing that. We're seeing that in terms of dining tables and bar carts and some other things that are just kind of coming back into uh, into our forecasting or into our demand that has been really sort of interesting. Um, the last thing on the business side is obviously uh, raising money as a startup is sort of part of what you do. And that has been really fun over the, the course of the last few years because of the uncertainty in the financial markets. And we've seen interest rates and, and sort of had to be creative around how we absorb all of these things as well. But so much of a testament to the team that we have that, you know, we kind of take all of these things on as, as great opportunities and we're still around to, to tell the stories. And I, you know, there are days where I'm like, well, this is going to be a really interesting chapter of the book. <laughs> yeah, Welcome to startup life. I love it. Yeah. You know, it's been, a, it's been a, I've had a lot of pleasure talking to you here, but I'm going to ask you the, before I let you go, I need to ask you the most important question I got, and it's advice for women in supply chain looking to enter the C-suite or upper management. Those ladies out there who want to follow in your footsteps, Kristen, you got any advice for them? Yeah. We, you know, it's funny. At Manifest, I had a lot of conversations with the women who were there about like, why, don't, why do you think there's not as many women in supply chain? And I think we just drop out. I mean, some of it is like you have to make that investment up front because you're not going to look around and see a lot of other women in supply chain. And so you kind of have to be bold and, and sort of a trailblazer yourself uh, and provide that that role model for others. And even if you think that other people aren't watching, they, they probably are. So, I mean, stick with it. But my other advice, and this probably goes for everybody who wants to sort of progress in, a, in operations or supply chain or any kind of leadership role is keep taking those those challenges that scare you because uh, those are where you learn the most, not only about what you uh, about what you can do yourself as a person, but also you learn so much that sort of goes into that toolbox for the next uncertain situation that you find yourself in. And that's really what experience is, is sort of building that toolbox and being able to step up and, and go into another, you know, unknown situation with lots of ambiguity. So to, you know, don't be afraid to be afraid. Well, Hey, thank you so much for joining us at Global Supply Chain Week and educating our audience. I really appreciate it. Amazing. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's great to chat with you. Take care. We'll talk again soon. Appreciate your time. Anyways, meanwhile, take a look at this tech right here. Okay. So Brian Porter, he just toured an Amazon fulfillment center. Um, and he says, in, he says, incredible, he says, incredible uh, inventory is stored in constantly moving shelves. Robots take the shelf to the big station. It, Inventory is randomly placed on shelves, tracked by cameras, uh, ghost store technology. They spread inventory for the same skew out across bins, so it's always closer to the pick station. Inventory counts are automated with cameras. The computing that goes into this operation is unbelievable. What a competitive advantage. Got a, got a new guest right near next to me. <laughs> you, you like those uh, robots? You deal with robots a little bit. A Smart little stuff. Bit. Yeah. Introduce yourself, sir. 
Hey, uh, I am Dustin Kell. I'm head of transportation at uh, Wabi. Uh, I would say the next generation autonomous truck developer based out of Toronto. Interesting. So what is the conversation around autonomous trucks? Because you just got back from Manifesto, saw you there. You got back, I think, at midnight last night from, uh, from Rila. Yeah. What are people talking about in this space? Yeah, I, I personally think it's a, a great time for autonomous trucking because you've had kind of that first generation of autonomous trucks. And I mean, quite frankly, we don't have a, a viable product yet on the road, if we're honest yeah. about that. Uh, but for the next generation developers like Quabi, uh, really the leader in uh, what I would say AI and simulation approach, that's really going to be how we get there. Those are bold claims. What is Wabi for those who, who don't know? Yeah, so uh, Wabi, uh, Wabi was founded in May 2021 by Raquel Erdison. And I don't okay. say this lightly, I mean, <laughs> she literally is considered one of the global leaders in artificial intelligence and simulation. Interesting. She's been in self-driving and AI simulation for uh, over 20 years. Uh, she founded the Vector Institute out of uh, Toronto, uh, that's V-E-C-T-O-R, and really has set the standard uh, for much of the technology that we talk about uh, in this space. So uh, really exciting stuff that she's doing. And, and quite frankly, as we, we talk about this um, type of technology, it's really the first autonomy stack that is teaching the truck how to drive, not program engineers or the staffs of 1,000 and 2,000 people. There is dynamic technology actually teaching the truck how to drive. Now, I was, I was looking into how Wabi worked, right? And it seemed like there was two sides to it. There's the Wabi driver, yeah. right? And then there's the Wabi world simulator. How does sure. the Wabi driver work? What is that? Yeah, so the, the Wabi driver is actually, I would say, a, a result uh, of Wabi World. So let's talk about Wabi World first. Okay. So uh, think about uh, really the, the LIDAR, radar, the sensors that are getting the inputs uh, from the truck. And then so that all that goes into Wabi World in the simulation and the AI. And that's what's really driving into the, the stack that's teaching the truck how to drive. Like that right there? Yes. Yeah, so that's actually some of the, uh, the learning and the simulation, the regeneration that we talk about often. And so that's the testing and learning. But what's really important about this stack, it's actually controllable and editable. And so as you see the sensor placement there, uh, really in the center of that grill, uh, our simulation is actually helping us understand where the best placement for those sensors are too. What, so what is, because you make the software and you also make the sensors, right? Well, not necessarily. Okay. So we partner with the sensor okay. companies. Yes. Because I so. want to know that. What is the, because I, I have, I last year I got a tour of a bunch of different autonomous truck companies and I got yeah. to get familiar with what Torque does and Kodiak does and Plus does and, and how everyone's different ideas are and they all have a different approach to sensors. Sure. Yeah, and so the, the sensors, it's a great discussion now, and I, I think for the runway uh, of autonomy that we're now seeing their ability to scale up production and really commercialize uh, as well. So some really great players in that space. But uh, again, a key differentiator is, is Wabi's a technology company. We, we don't want to build a humongous fleet. Yeah. We want to be that autonomy stack that goes into an OEM with really day one production in mind. That's really important because uh, as we've seen in that first generation, you, you really can't retrofit these trucks. And as a trucker, I'll say it simply is uh, you can't put a second mortgage on your truck. Yeah. You, you can't put the back porch and the extra bedroom and that just doesn't work in the financing you world. You can't buy like a, a million two truck. Like exactly. owner operators are not buying a million, a truck that costs a million two. Correct, yeah. I guess you wouldn't, you wouldn't even be an owner operator at that point. You would be like a, like a, what would you call that person? Have you guys come up with a name for that? No, I'm sure you could. You're the marketing guy. I, got I, I the, know. I yeah. got to think about this one. <laughs> well, you know, interesting. So what is, what's harder right now? Is it that, what is holding it back? Because you say not a viable product. Is it, is it the tech or is it the regulatory environment or is it just both need to, to meet at some point? So those are great questions. And I'll share, I mean, being a, a 16 year trucker and I uh, think, most everybody that knows me, I spent 16 years uh, at U.S. Express, was over... What, what uh, did they have you in over there? Oh, uh, so I was uh, 12 years at Total Transportation yeah. out of Mississippi, which I'll give them a plug. One of the greatest trucking companies in the country. Just yeah. gets utility operations based out of Jackson, about uh, 1,200 drivers. And so I was able to oversee our dedicated division, our, our, all of our sales, commercial efforts, but then came up to Chattanooga in 2019, was SVP of uh, enterprise sales, and then also SVP of uh, operations. Yeah. And so it really gave me a lens and uh, you got to come in the Fuller family, as you know well too, for the innovation that they bring to this industry and U.S. Express and, and certainly the city uh, and freight waves. But I got to, to oversee the autonomous truck development program for four years. Yeah. So I've worked with uh, many of the other developers 
developers, which I really, well, you know, champion in a lot of ways too. Um, but I'll also say there, there is that differentiator that we've seen in the second season, and that's you know a big reason why I went to to Wabi. Interesting. So how, what does the road to viability look like? What's the timeline? When, when does that happen and what needs to happen? Yeah. So uh, one, you mentioned regulatory. Yeah. And so I, I think that's a, a great uh, discussion point. And I used to chair the, the automated truck committee for the American Trucking Association. So I had a trucker there facilitating a lot of the conversation with all the developers and ecosystem holders, OEMs, you name it. And um, what we can say today is there's not necessarily a federal framework uh, but we're now in excess of 40 states that will allow for autonomous truck testing. Mm. And so we've really got a state-by-state -state framework that are, allows the key routes, say I-10, that we see in the corridor, the Sunbelt states. Uh, I've also served on what's called the, the Volpe Center within the DOT on an expert working committee that uh, really is preparing that recommended recommendation for, for uh, a federal framework to Congress this year, too. Interesting. So when you have these conversations, what do the touch points look like? Like one of the biggest issues we come up with, like for example, eventually we're gonna be putting, putting these on autonomous trucks, right? Yeah. I mean, on electric trucks. What does like refueling look like and, and going to a receiver and what place is, is this middle mile? Where do you see this all factoring in? Yeah, so again, another great question. And just to be clear, uh, for Wabi, for us, it is a hub-to-hub -hub model. Yeah. And I think most of our peers within this industry and the ecosystem stakeholders uh, that are really involved would prefer that hub-to-hub -hub model. I think that's what is going to be commercial commercialized first, but also uh, what I would say is operationalized first. That's more controlled and static and will allow that kind of local P&D pickup and delivery model uh, for human drivers in the, the near future. Interesting. Is the driver going away? And when would that happen? So it's a great question. And I always say, like, I'm a, I'm a trucker. Yeah. I mean, I'm a 16-year trucker. I got family in this industry and will advocate for the driver in so many ways. And, and that's what I love about autonomous trucks because, you know, and just like yourself, Dooner, I mean, you, you love this industry. I see you champion these guys and sure. uh, the men and women of this industry. And I just, I think we can do better uh, as companies because we've not done a great job in service to, I think, these drivers when it comes to network and to freight. And I really think autonomy can lead that discussion to provide more static runs in a, a better network. And you're seeing so many startups come into this place now, not yeah. just in autonomous trucks, but great people like, uh, you know, Optimal Dynamics or Freight Science and some of these guys that you know so well too. Is there so, ever any existential dread about that though? Because one of you screws up, it's so bad for the entire industry. Yes, I, I mean, the, the expectation of perfection, it, it is there. And yeah. that's something that uh, I work hard on in terms of the social acceptance. It's a lot of education and advocacy, and uh, we have to have more drivers uh, at the table actually speaking into the technology. And you'll see Wabi do uh, a great job of that this next year of how we en engage the driver community, because that's another one of my frustration points that uh, maybe season one of uh, autonomy has left out, maybe fleet execs and drivers to be a part of the design of the tech technology or what we say is we want to open up the black box and yeah. show that how we get there. Interesting. And so what, how do you get there? What are the next steps and stages? Like, where are you guys now? What's your next product? Yeah. So for us in the fourth quarter, you saw, we, we announced Wabi Driver and uh, one of the more exciting partnerships that we had uh, announced in January was uh, a strategic investment from Volvo Capital. Mm -hmm. And so for Volvo Capital, I mean, they've, they've really unlocked a lot of resources for us in terms of, of innovation. So we've got uh, some really key partnerships that we're going to be announcing in the first half of this year that will start to make sense. And really for us, it, it puts that flag in the ground that, again, we are a technology company. We know what we're really good at it, Wabi. Yeah. And we want to partner with those that can build up this technology uh, across the trucking industry because you need really traditional trucking and the new technology together. And I think for me, I love connecting the dots in yeah. just kind of this ecosystem. So uh, like, do you need an OEM or are you dead in the water without an OEM? So in season two, I would say objectively, and keep in mind the four years previously I did this, if you if you don't have a, a path to an OEM partnership, um, you probably are dead in the water. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that that has to be table stakes. And so um, in this season, there is a winter season of AV for, I think, some that have had burn rates of a billion dollars a year. And this is all public information, but that's not sustainable. So yeah. you have to have a key differentiator in your technology and a road or a path with an OEM and these other stakeholders in the industry.
Interesting, interesting. So uh, my last question, it kind of ties into my next guest because he makes automated trailers. So what mm. kind of thought is put into how this integrates with the rest of supply chain, sort of automated warehouse, automated docks, automated, automated trailers? Yeah, so I'm actually a, a trailer junkie too and uh, actually an advisor for a company called Repower, okay. digital trailer platform. And, and so in this next season of, of automation, I'll say, Trailers have been so overlooked and neglected. I mean, these are trailing assets that are now in excess of fifty thousand dollars a piece. Yeah. And many of these large fleets, as you know, have three to one or five to one ratios. And you can't optimize freight uh, without trailers. Yeah. You can't optimize autonomous trucks without trailers. Well, interesting story. So, like a lot of these EV companies, like uh, to one of them being Hylion, they Thomas Hillary was telling me this story about how originally they were like, let's just put the battery on the trailer. You have so much space, and then someone in in, who knows trucking said here's a huge problem you're always going to have yeah positioning those trailers yes they're always going to be out of position unless you have a lot of redundancy yes and and repositioning those trailers i mean that builds into so many of these ecosystem problems as you know drivers may have a 14 hour clock or this 10 to 11 hour day but they're only getting six and a half seven hours utility and sometimes it's because they're on an easter egg hunt okay. looking for trailers and so we have such an opportunity to improve the visibility of trailers so our drivers can get more miles too well people who want to learn more about wabi where would they go to uh to to get educated yeah, so some exciting things first. Um, email me, uh, D Kel. It's it looks like Cole, but it's yeah. D Kel K O E H L at Kel. Wabi, uh, W A A B uh, I dot A I. Uh, also, I'll share with you that we're going to be at Food Shippers. I know many of your viewers go to many of these conferences. Sure. We're taking a Wabi driver, our truck. You know, we'll be at Food Shippers in March, uh, out in California. We'll be what doing kind a of truck great. You on? What? Um, so Can we've got, <laughs> well, we want to, we, we want to be OEM agnostic. Okay. So I'll, I'll just say that at this point. A good truck. Um, but the truck that you've seen in these videos, um, we'll be showcasing that in our, our trailer as well. And we'll have our, our leadership team out there. And then certainly uh, Wabi.ai uh, online as well. Very cool. Well, hey, I bought you some parting gifts right here. Awesome. Got your, like, yes, truck. that's got your great. Truck shirt. Thank it's you. XL, these are a little tight after you wash them. Okay. So I went off a size for you. Off. Yeah, sure. Especially when we see each other at the Children's Museum, we can be. Oh, right yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> <laughs> I totally forgot we bumped into each other there. Such yes. a great place. If you come down to Chattanooga yeah. and you got kids, come down to the uh, Creative Discovery Museum right over there. Yes. You can't see where I'm pointing to. Why am I pointing? <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. <laughs> yeah, enjoyed it. Take Thanks, care. Just exit stage left. To awesome. Lie. Tanner, my friend Tanner will show you out. By the way, there's a comment here uh, from Zachary Muckick, and he says, human interaction in sales is dying, and it's quite sad. In-person door knocking is essential for trusted business relationships. He's right. He's right. You know who else is right quite often? Sean Jones, the CEO over at Quick Loads. He's here with us now. Sean, what's up, man? Hey, Tim. How are you guys doing from Wet to Truck? Well, uh, I was thought it was great that you guys agreed to come and visit, and uh, we're going to do a live demonstration. One of our customers' trucks just came out of the plant. We always test them before we send them out, so we're going to do a live loading and unloading. Oh, but wow. first, I'd like to point out the last time I was on your show, you got me with a question wheel. Yes. So at the end of this, I want to get you a question wheel. Okay. I'll remind you. Let's go out. <laughs> Let's take it out. Let's take us for a walk. <laughs> you Where know, are you, the by office, the way? Which previously you referred to as a prison cell. Where is the prison cell, by the way? Where where are you uh, locked up these That's days? Right. We're in uh, Athens, Ohio. This is uh, my office is right on the on the plant floor. That way, I can keep uh, track of what's going on. Uh, there's our new six kilowatt fiber laser, which is getting put together. Uh, over what does here that do? Is our new does that, what does the laser do? Our new press break. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What does the uh, laser do? Oh, it's really neat. It's got a shuttle table, so it can cut through up to an inch of steel almost perfectly. And it also has a tube laser on it, so we can cut all kinds of uh, neat things, like in our drive shafts and our other parts. Really, It'll really speed up our production. We're excited about that. For one thing, with the laser, we don't have to processing flag and stuff. Interesting. Oh, are you still there? Yeah, still of course. I lost you. No, I'm good. Okay, I'm still go. here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Could you, oh, like, amput uh, amputate an arm with that thing? Bend something? Ooh. Nice. <laughs> you got all Sean. And you, can, you can give somebody a neat tattoo, too. You, know, we, it's, uh, you got so many new is, toys. Uh, where, we, where we keep the engineers. Say hi, nice. engineers. Hi, engineers. You know, what's the truck? <laughs> hey, guys. Good seeing you all. See? See, they always, whenever I come in here, they always wake up and they have cool stuff going on on the screens. So Where'd you find that I think it's crew? a screensaver. What'd you say? Where'd you find that Motley crew? 
Yeah. <laughs> They're all just, you know, OU graduates, so they were cheap. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sean, you're not by that uh, dra- you're all, you're not by that derailment, are you? You guys are are you located near there? Oh no, no, that's uh, part okay. of the state. Okay. Uh, cool. looks like Tom's making progress on redoing our tool room. Um, there's our big monster machine. That's the 40 foot, uh, plasma, uh, table. It'll cut, I think 12 foot wide by 40 foot long. And you see over there, they're putting together a, uh, 40 foot trailer. So Sean, let me ask you something. Do you assemble the trailers? Uh You assemble the trailers fully in this, uh, this warehouse right here? Uh, well, not personally. (laughs) Yeah. Um, um, there's a, I'm not sure who that is, but anyway, <laughs> that's uh, putting together a bumper there. And then, then this is one of our beds. But yeah, um, what happens is, is right now we're getting the bed shipped to us from our manufacturer, TMCO in Nebraska. And then we put them all together here, and then we end up doing the plumbing and the wiring, that sort of thing. So this is the dirty side. This is the fabrication side. We'll go over to the assembly side. So once they have a bed all together, it then goes off to hot dip galvanizing. And we do that because hot dip galvanizing lasts forever. And then it comes over to this side, and they end up wiring it and plumbing it and putting all the little pieces together. Hey, Very right. cool. I like it. I like the, I so like the warehouse. The, yeah, so here's the assembly side, and they're starting to put together this thing. Looks like there's a, still wiring and plumbing it. And uh, all the assemblies are getting ready to go on trailers. Uh, there's a... I think that's one of the new electric power pack trucks. Let's wander over there real quick. When you say assembly, when you say assembly, what is going on to a trailer? Okay. So what they did, this, this bed before was upside down and they put in all the wiring and all the plumbing and they put all the hydraulic cylinders on it. And then they flip it back over and they put it on the bogey, the underside, which is also assembled here. And then they attach it to the, front the gooseneck and, you know, they put in the motors and the gears and all the wiring and all the plumbing here hydraulic tank all the little toolboxes and stuff all go in um so this one must be an electric one uh all of our trailers before used to ship with this 38 horsepower electronic fuel injected engine but in 2023, we made our standard a 14,000 kilowatt or 14,000 14, watt uh, electric power pack. And so they're, it's a zero cost option, but almost everything is shipping now with the electric system. And then uh, we still ship some of the engines. But one of the nice things about that is, is then it becomes pretty much maintenance zero. So it does, nobody's out there checking oil or gas or that sort of thing. And it always works. We just really like the electric power pack. Interesting. Uh, and one of the things we did, and I think you'll see it on this truck, is so we build trailers and we build trucks. One of the issues with trucks is if the truck doesn't have a transmission that can handle um, a power takeoff and a hydraulic pump, then you, you basically can't put a quick load on it. So what we did was we took our electric power pack that we put on the trailers, and now we put that on the trucks. Yeah, that's what has it. So that now any truck, it doesn't matter whether or not what kind of transmission it has in it, um, now it can run a quick load, can have our electric power pack on there and run the whole thing. So, wow. Well, let's go outside and let's go look at the customer's truck and load a container. Oh, yeah. Is that, I, I, I'm excited to see this, uh, this demo. This almost happened on stage in Arkansas, but there just wasn't space to do it. So now we finally yeah. <laughs> get, to, get, to, get to do this one on what the truck. Yeah, that was a neat one because I got, to, uh, I got the engineering guys to get that truck to do it automatically. So on stage, I was able to push a couple of buttons in Arkansas and load a container here in Ohio. Nice. Doesn't look too, too bad out today. Yeah, it's pretty muddy. <laughs> Thanks, George. It's muggy here. It's muggy in our studio. It's a very immersive interview. We're in the same humidity. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. You know how to use that thing, so Sean? What your, what your truck drivers are about to see is that I am not a truck driver. Okay. Here we go. 
But quick loads is so easy. If you can back up a truck, you can load a container. It kind of runs in um, batches. Right now we're doing a bunch of these trucks. For a while we were doing a lot of trailers. I think everything next on the billboard are, are all trailers for a little while. And is the trucks mostly just doing those transmissions? Yeah, somebody out there. Are the trucks mostly what? Just doing the uh, transmissions. Uh, no, we're about half and half now between the electric and the uh, PTO takeoff. Interesting. I really like the electric, though, because we've had a bunch of uh, customers where their drivers will accidentally leave the PTO pump on and blow the, the uh, pump up. With the electric, that's just not possible. It's kind of nice. All right. So we look like we're in about position. <laughs> Turn on the PTO, because this is the PTO one, not the electric. All right. So see exactly what's going on behind me. Push a button. Locks come out. Wedges are going to go down. That's going to go out. Now, I haven't done this for a while, Dooner, so uh, <laughs> hopefully I won't screw it up. That up. I heard something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Emily can show you what's going on behind us here in a second. Now, the back of the beds on both the trucks and the trailers are on these big rollers. Yeah, And the reason we do that is so that um, we won't be pushing or we won't be pulling the uh, um, container across the ground or dragging the uh, trailer. What we're going to be doing is we're just going to be rolling underneath it. So lift wedges, pick it up. Change, grab it. I move my wedges down out of the way. Now I just pull it on. Is there like a sensor or anything that, that tells you that you're like perfectly lined up to the container or is that all driver skill? It's all driver skill. Wow. Well, you should pat yourself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually you're, pretty easy. <laughs> you're the it driver. Really is pretty easy. <laughs> so, so this is, uh, I appreciate that, but, but I am is, not a truck driver. If you ever see me back up a trailer, you would know that. But it's it's just it's pretty easy. We um we're looking at adding a sensor for that, but we just haven't needed it yet. Yeah, drivers aren't that bad yet. Just wait until the uh. No, what drivers are, are, you know, whenever we have like a real truck driver come here, it's just amazing what they can do. They really yeah, make so, me look. Uh, so what about in an autonomous an autonomous world, Sean? Have you worked with any autonomous trucking companies to see how these would integrate? Well, we've talked to a couple of them, and one of the things is that since we essentially build a smart trailer, you know, it already has a Wi-Fi network on it, it already has a computer, it's already set up so it can test tire pressure and everything. All of that stuff is is already there, and so it's a, it would be an easy fit. Um, we talked to one of the big companies not too long ago. Oh, there, there we go. We're all loaded and ready to roll. And yeah. we are rolling. So, I don't know, what was that, maybe two minutes, something like that? If even. Um, but yeah, I guess a lot of the um, companies, they can back up trailers and everything yet, but I don't think they're quite ready yet to uh, be able to um, load and unload containers. One of the nice advantages to our system is since we're just moving the container and the, same, the trailer stays hooked to the truck, you can move entire depots worth of uh, um, containers, ground level to ground level, without having to change trailers, without having to connect and disconnect. One of the big problems with autonomous trucks, and it's a problem that they're working pretty hard to solve, is when you back up to a trailer, those freaking airlines are in different locations from trailer to trailer. You have to plug in the electric. And I'm sure you've seen this, but uh, you know, half the time the airline connector has been skewed one way or the other or bent. And so it's really difficult. You usually have to have a person involved. But with our system, you know, you, the trailer stays on there. You're just uh, picking up and moving around the containers, and the containers is what the uh, holds the merchandise. So, ready to do the uh, question wheel? Yeah, head over to that. I do have a, and I'll ask you some questions where you're on your way over there. One of it is, how did you develop this? Just riff on that as you walk to that wheel. What what made you come up with the idea? Okay, oh, let me walk up down the side. Um,
Oh, I'm back. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I got my degree from Ohio University of Engineering. But, you know, most of the time when you're working in an engineer, you're, you're in some cubicle somewhere. And all my friends that went out and worked in real industry didn't like it. So I decided to stay in business. And one of the businesses we were in was mobile storage. First, it started with uh, construction. And I noticed that on our job sites, we had all these trailers and such moving around that never got moved. And then what we did was we moved into mobile storage because it was, it, it was much more practical than having all these trailers. But then we realized how hard they were to move. So my mobile storage business got big enough. I sold off to Mini Mobile. And I thought, you know, I got this non-compete. I'm going to solve this, this uh, problem of moving these shipping containers. Because, you know, how hard could it be? Yeah. <laughs> it took probably $4 million and five years longer than I thought. <laughs> but we finally got a really good movie quick load. And uh, so we started making them. And uh, here we are. Interesting. Who, who's, have you sold, how many have you sold? Have you sold any of them? Oh, yeah. There's hundreds of them out there. Cool. Okay. Hey, that looks like my wheel. Okay. It is. <laughs> <laughs> we, we found your wheel. And we duplicated it. Put a few different questions on there, though. Are you okay. ready? I'm you ready. Spin, All right, spin away. <laughs> okay. Oh, hey, this is a good question. All right. All right. Tim, if you had to fight a bear, would you want to fight that bear in a jello pit? And if so, what flavor of jello would you want? Like, as opposed to like the forest? No, no, you have to fight. Uh, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, you have okay. to fight the bear. Would, would you want to fight it in the forest or, or in a jello pit? No, jello's good. I think I could distract it with the, the jello and maybe get it to eat some of the, the gelatin instead of me. And I would go with green, right? I mean, you got to love green jelly. Yeah. Uh, you know, remember they, had, remember they were green jello? They had to switch their name to green jelly. They had the little pig song in the 90s. So I'm going, uh, with, <laughs> I'm going with green jello, man. I don't think I'll win. Yeah, that's a, I think too, because if you go with red jelly, jelly or jello, then you can't really tell if you're bleeding. Correct. Whereas the green, you'd be able to see it. Yeah. So, yeah. It's and like, I think that any kind of any kind of slipperiness or uh, advantage would be to your advantage, not the bears. In red jello, nobody can see you bleed is like one of those sayings. Like in space, nobody can hear you scream. It's just <laughs> it's just one of those things you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So. Well, hey, what's the? Oh. Let me before I let you go. What's the future of trailers? Yeah. What do you think is the next stage in trailers? Dustin said something interesting. He said they've been long ignored. Yeah. Um, trailers are treated as a box with eight wheels and, uh, they're, they're commodities. I mean, uh, a good friend of mine builds, um, flatbed aluminum trailers. And I think he has a really nice product. He's like, look, I can't, I'm not in charge of my own price. It's a commodity. There's 50 other companies doing this. And so what happens is everybody's just looking at that bomb dollar price. And it's very difficult to make trailers, uh, you know, uh, have even cost even like a thousand dollars more, but I think especially with the autonomous, that's going to change because if you've got an autonomous truck pulling a trailer down the highway, it's going to have to know something about that trailer. It's going to have to know if a tire is going bad. You know, it's going to have to know something. And so, whether like it or not, I think trailers are going to have to get smarter. And the way our system works is, since we already have that computer and we already have all that stuff and the Wi-Fi network on there. It could tell, well, I mean, I loaded a container here in Athens, Ohio, when I was standing on the stage in Bentonville, Arkansas. You know, it could tell a driver or a maintenance guy 2,000 miles away, hey, I got a low tire. And I think that that's really going to, you know, I think is, it's, that's the way trailers are going to go. They're going to have to get smarter. It just, you know, it, it's true that they're commodity. And I, it's true that a lot of people have had a hard time trying to add anything to them. But especially with autonomous, I think you, you know, you're going to have to add those sensors. You're going to have to make the trailer smart too. Fortunately, we're way ahead of everybody on that. No, you are. You are. Does it? Do, if, do you think like you feel a little too early, or you know the market's going to mature? Um, well, so for example, right now uh, we actually uh, moved some of our salespeople out of sales and into production because that's where they started. Mm. Because we have over a two million dollar back order. You know, we're almost a year out now. And so I don't think we're too early. I think people are seeing that value there. It's for us, our biggest single problem is making it fast enough. And so I really think that this, you know, uh, maybe if you were Wabash and you moved all of your production to quick load, then yeah, you, you'd be too early. But I think that we're seeing that we can't keep up with the demand now. And we only see the demand getting bigger and bigger. So, 
Very cool. Well, hey, people who want more information about this, they want to get themselves a smart trailer, where do I send them to? <laughs> www.quickloads.com. Nice. Are you going to be out on this? Are you going out to any events or anything anytime soon? People, people see you out uh, We're going to be at Con Expo. Okay. Going to be at Con Expo. Uh, and then I think next week I'll be at the TP conference out in Long Beach. How about uh, Matt? Con Expo will actually have you in there. You be, will you be at Matt's? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think I'm going to make that one. Okay. Should well, I? Well, I think you should. Mid-America <laughs> Truck Show. Are you going to be there? Uh, oh my God. The, the Back the Truck Up team is going to be there. There's a live What the Truck from there. But I'm going to be here in the studio, oh, okay. and the guys are going to be over at um, – at Matt's, I like I in-person okay. events are, are cool, but like I find them kind of stressful. So I only go to I only go to a couple a year. <laughs> yeah, I, like I I always go to Matt's to walk it, but we've never shown there. I think that you know sooner or later we'll have to go there and show it. So, but once Shot. again, it's it's like we we were arguing about why do we why are we going to Con Expo when we can't build them fast stuff now? So yeah, we, <laughs> you know. Yeah, advertising is not really the problem. Hey, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for showing off your workspace there and showing the trailer in action. It's really cool, and I love to see the growth. All right. Thanks a lot, Tim. Take care, everybody. Take care of you. Well, no, don't take care of everybody. Before you go, a couple orders of business here. First of all, if you haven't registered for this, you're not on live.freightwaves.com. Go ahead and register. There's a free giveaway. You can win, the, win this thing called the Big Green Egg. I don't know what it is. Thomas Watson says it's cool. There's a HomePod Mini. There's a Hydro Flash Cooler, an Apple TV, a Yeti chair to put your fanny in. And, uh, yeah, coming up after this, we've got a fireside chat on pharmaceutical supply chains in the wake of the pandemic. You've been listening to What the Truck. This is a podcast that happens Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays live at noon Eastern time, always at your leisure on demand. Look up What the Truck wherever you get your audio podcast or download the freeways you have to watch this in stunning HD. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Tuna, D-O-O-N-E-R, and don't be a stranger. <laughs>